protected by flame. So, um, oh, I'm sorry. It's, it's taking a cool <laughs> no, I can hear. Oops. There we go. You want to quit? I'm okay. sorry, guys. Okay, we're all good. Um, so, this one is a parking protected bike lane, um, where you have the parking uh, set back from the curb and then the, the bike way goes between the cars and the curb of one kind. Um, you can have uh, bollard protected. So, there's a couple bollards in this picture. Um, but basically, a buffer space that has uh, something vertical in within that space. So it's not just not just visually separating you, but there's something you know the driver is going to have to hit if, <laughs> if they're going to go into the, the bike lane space. This can, this can also look like a curb. You can have the, the bike lane up at the same level as the sidewalk. Um, you can have basically what looks like parking stops kind of. Um, lining the bikeway. So there's there's a bunch of different ways bike lanes can be protected. Um, see. Buffered bike lanes. I'm going to step down from that. You have your uh, striped space that is giving you, it can be anywhere from a foot to, I've seen five feet, depending on how much space there is in the roadway. That is this a uh, hatched area. Um, so it's a visual separation, but can be a lot more comfortable, especially if there's higher volumes, a little bit higher speeds, um, helps people feel more comfortable. A standard bike lane you're probably familiar with, that's when you've got the, just the one line um, rather than a buffer or vertical separation. <laughs> Um, you have one line, bikeway one side, traffic on the other side. Um, and that can that can be comfortable for people in lower volume, lower speed situations. Um, a wide shoulder can be comfortable in a more rural setting. Um, I I think we may have changed the wide shoulder in the plan to a shared use path. So uh, I have to double check if we actually have still have this type in the plan. Um, but that's that's something we would <clears throat> consider in a only in a more rural um, setting. Bicycle Boulevard. That's one that I think a lot of people are less familiar with. Basically, this is going to be a low volume, and when I say low volume, I mean low car volume, um, low speed, usually often on a more residential street um, where you have bikes using the street. You don't have you don't have a separated space for them like in a conventional bike lane or a buffered bike lane. You're in the street, but you're doing a lot to calm traffic. So it's things like a traffic circle. Um, this is one that's actually a, a temporary one um, made out of like wood chips and sandbags. Um, so that's super low cost. Or you can have ones made out of concrete. So it'd be like traffic circles, um, things to divert traffic. So you might. Um, limit the opportunities people have to turn onto that street. Um, sort of discouraging it as a, a, a street that people might um, slip onto to avoid traffic and to, to, to see through the neighborhood. You're, um, you could have speed bumps, you could have, the list goes on, but it basically um, it's sometimes people will just paint a bike symbol on the ground in a residential street and call that a bike boulevard. But we want to make sure that there's traffic calming associated with that. Is anyone familiar with um, Balmoral Street in uh, Sterling Parks? 
or it's very very strange park, Sterling Pond. It's kind of the street where you can't take a right turn lane on it because it's striped and there's that barrier in the front. That's sort of what Maria is talking a little bit about in terms of kind of managing traffic flow. So cars can technically go around and get access to it, but they can only do it from one direction and that limits the volume. So mm -hmm. that th those sort of things, and it really can take a variety of different forms. Yeah. Um, and then the last one is Greenway. So this is, Where I'd say they're the rest of these, what I just talked through, those are kind of universal definitions. Like Greenway can really be used in a bunch of different ways. So the way that we're using it for this plan, um, we mean a, a street where you uh, basically turn a street into a linear park. Um, so that can be making it a one way and taking a good portion of the street to put in a shared use path and a bunch of trees and you know it can even go to the level of having a playground or, or really really actually making it a linear park um so there are a couple opportunities to think about doing something like this um it would involve a street reconstruction which is the most expensive kind of thing you can do but um, there are a couple of streets where a reconstruction need has already been identified because of utility issues and pavement issues and, and other things. So um, this type of improvement is, is something to think about for reconstructions and especially where we want to improve water quality. Um, you can put in rain gardens, bioswales, all kinds of things to capture stormwater. Um, so this is kind of the, the special improvement type river ball specific <laughs> um, that we're calling a greenway. So any questions about the different types of linear improvements? You do have wide shoulders in the plan. Yes. You, in, you, in, you, in you, asked, you have a plan? Yeah, you do. Yes, so to clarify, city staff took a look at that and then had some edits and so we're going to make the edits to the map once we have your comments as well and so one of the city staff edits was to uh, do a shared use path on radio road instead of a wide shoulder mm -hmm. oh well so it's paul so i'm paul as well I'm paul as well yeah yeah i think that will connection so if that's the only wide shoulder we had then then right now we're only thinking about we're not thinking about wide shoulders but um, that's that's still a possible facility type. Um, so the spot improvement types are about crossings. So this is simpler. It's just either an enhanced crossing or an intersection improvement. An enhanced crossing is going to be an opportunity to do maybe like a mid block crossing. Um, so what I'm showing here, this is a demonstration project. This one's a short term project, but basically narrowing down the roadway um, at this mid block crossing so that cars slow down and the crossing is more visible versus an intersection improvement. It's going to be more like at uh, Cascade and Maine where it, it's going to require a traffic study. It's a it's a more complex situation. Um, something like building a roundabout is going to be more of an intersection improvement or enhanced crossing is um, it's less intensive. So that's the terminology we're using to talk about the different types of recommendations. Any questions about that? Um, so we have the different types of treatments, and then we have three different implementation timelines. Short-term projects are what we call quick fixes. These are demonstration projects or quick build projects. So a demonstration project is 
usually done using temporary materials that are low cost. Um, so it'll be paint, tape, bollards, um, that type of thing. A quick build project is also going to be cheaper, but it's going to be intended to be in the street for a longer period of time. You can have a demonstration project that's one day up to you know, six months, um, not, you know, maybe a little bit more. A quick build project, you you might be wanting wanting that to be in the street for one to five years, something like that. So you're going to use higher quality, more durable materials for a quick build project. Um, so those are great tools because the other types of projects just take a little bit more time. So um, we're able to identify some opportunities to put things in the ground quickly, to try them out, to, um, to more rapidly make improvements, but then we can work towards permanent long-term solutions. Um, Medium-term projects are those permanent improvements that don't require a street reconstruction. So we're not moving around the curbs and having to think about where is the stormwater going to drain and the utilities and, and all of that. Um, but it's things like sidewalk infill. There's going to be some concrete, things are permanent, um, but not, not as complicated or as expensive as a reconstruction. And then our let's our last category is long term. So that's permanent improvements with reconstruction or also with new development. We're categorizing some projects that um, only need to happen if development happens as long term projects. So we have those. Oh, and I have pictures for all of them, I guess. <laughs> um, so that's the, an example of a short term uh, demonstration project. Um, this is more, I think it's hard to see in this picture, but there's a concrete curb put in here to protect the bikeway. Um, but they just added that to the street as is. Um, and then with reconstruction, um, looking at the Kinney corridor plan, especially, which I don't know how familiar everyone is with that. But that talks a lot about how improving water quality should be key to um, how we use public space. So if a reconstruction happens, that can be really front and center. Okay. Um, so <clears throat> what we're going to get into in the next month is actually prioritizing our projects. And the idea is to prioritize them within those implementation buckets. So identify the highest priority short-term projects, highest priority medium-term, highest priority long-term. And for those short-term projects, um, start making a plan for how can we get those in the ground in the short-term, um, in say, one to two years. Um, whereas those high priority medium term projects, it's about setting the wheels in motion to make those happen within say five years or long term, setting the wheels in motion to make those happen within 10 years. Um, and in thinking about prioritization, we wanna choose projects that have more benefit to the community and more community support. Um, and use our plan goals in determining those benefits. So we agreed um, early on, let's say February, January, February, um, that accessibility, connectivity, health and safety, sustainability, and economic vitality were going to be goals of this plan. So we want to use that as a lens to think about which projects provide the most benefits and therefore should be um, prioritized. So, okay, I've talked to you a lot, um, but I want to know with our network recommendations, what would you add, what would you change, 
and which of the infrastructure improvements do you think would make the biggest difference for people walking and biking in River Falls? And I can open up <coughs> the map. So let me know if you want me to zoom in on any particular area. Were you guys able to access this or did you just look at the static map? That was also the, the still map that was sent along as well. I just looked at the I just still still map. Map. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. probably was fine. You probably said it. Yeah. No, no, that's okay. So in um in the recommendations, there's a, a link specifically that will lead you to this site, and you can kind of play around with it and turn on and off layers. Um, so you, if you want to look at specifically, okay, where are only greenways <clears> proposed, you can turn on off the layers or all all off the layers except for that, and look at it specifically. So mm -hmm. if if you'd like to do that, spend some time with it and play around, and shoot me an email if you're trouble, if you're having trouble accessing it. Um, and then also in the interactive map, you can click on any recommendation and it'll pull up some more information. So here I clicked on Second Street and it tells me the recommendation type is a buffered bike lane. The implementation timeline would be short term. Um, so basically, there's a way to do this likely with um, a quick build approach. Um, so we will start with did anybody did anybody come to this meeting with ideas about the recommendations that you want to share? Can we look at North Main kind of by Walgreens going north on the east side? Yeah, I, maybe I can speak to just yeah. one piece of it. Um, is there a is there a satellite layer? Oh, let me see. That might just it be helpful for orientation. Yeah, a big thing up there. I'm thinking more of a sidewalk in this case. Oh. Well, it's too to quick trip. Oh, and we can add on sidewalk and fill too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would yeah. be helpful. <laughs> So I, was, I did do it. I think it's just a layer. I'm sorry. Base. <laughs> well, anyways, so it's Powell and Maine. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> We're all squinting. Like, what is that thing? Yeah. So, so it is labeled. <laughs> Label is sidewalk infill. So, you think there should be sidewalk infill on, like, from Mountview Road up to Pomeroy? Yeah. On the east side? It stops at. Um, Powell. Yeah, at Powell where the stoplight is, uh, mm -hmm. it, the sidewalk stops on the east side and then going north. So just for some context, the, the sidewalk info we're talking about, this was a separate study that was done in 2016 that made recommendations. Mm -hmm. So we've just layered that on top of what they provided. It's not necessarily what they're saying is going to be part of plan, the part of the plan in terms of sidewalk infill as well. So. Um, so I think what is shown right here is um, is not all of the possible sidewalk infill. It, it's primarily looking at where we heard sidewalk infill was needed and um, as we're putting together the, the bicycle network, noting where where those needs are, basically so that the the bicycle network has sufficient facilities for people walking as well. So that said, there was the sidewalk infill report and one of the pieces of direction from staff is to look at that and make sure we're fully incorporating that into the network. So I don't think the sidewalk infill shown is fully done. 
to <laughs> that makes sense. But so you're saying um, you'd like to see sidewalk infill on the east side of Maine in that area? I would, yes. Mm -hmm. To continue that sidewalk. Mm -hmm. And so there another component of this is it's current staff practice to require development to have sidewalks on both sides of the street. Mm -hmm. So as new developments come in, that's kind of going to be the standard practice for the most part of what we're doing. So that's the kind of thing where you can piecemeal things in at a time. Mm -hmm. And it's not necessarily something we would infill beforehand or infill after the fact, if that makes sense. So I guess what I'm trying to say is there are standard practices that are more policy recommendations like that that'll be you know our code requires all new development to have sidewalk on both sides of the street going forward and that's how we'll address gaps in the trail network outside of just what needs to be infilled so do you guys follow me on that so it's like there's there's a couple different tools in the toolbox of exactly how we're going to get these done outside of what we're talking about right here and now in terms of the short term medium term and long term fixes so yeah there's, there's a lot of component, components. Yeah, I think Emily and I were talking earlier today too about that kind of policy piece being in the plan so that mm -hmm. new development will have pedestrian and bicycle access. Mm -hmm. um, right now we don't necessarily have the leverage in our code, so that will start to provide it for us. Mm -hmm. And then when we do code modifications, we can lean on this to, to be able to include that. So. So does everybody just follow? Just I want to make sure because it's, it's sort of complicated. Does everybody follow in terms of what we mean by policy versus um, project specifically? Okay, because like this this is kind of thing where if we got grant money from the WISDOT from from Wisconsin Department of Transportation and we said okay there needs to be a bike lane on Division Street, then we could implement that because it's already been built, right? But if there is a new development for the Apollo Road, for example, right, in which sidewalks coming in, then we could just mandate that as part of the development. The developer pays for it, so on and so forth, and, and that's sort of how we want to approach it. But the multiple different ways to, to get those things addressed. So. So then we don't end up with like a Boston lane where you have no sidewalks and a bunch of trees. Yeah. <laughs> you would put sidewalks. So yeah, if, if you look hard enough, you can find, you know, the the mistakes of past planning right. efforts, yeah. you know. And, it's and like, honestly, that piece of policy in the plan will help us when the trees come down and wash sure. to be able to yes. say, hey, this is the prime opportunity for us to right. get the sidewalk in, planting trees, what they're supposed to be, kind right. of stuff to mm -hmm. so Sure, that makes sense. Could you show us just how some of the areas of concern that you kind of walked through have been addressed? Just some, you know, those intersections. Yeah. I looked at it, but my I printed it. I'm, you know, a teacher, so we can't we can't use colored ink. So I printed it in black and white, which oh, didn't work. Oh, very well. I was, I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, so yeah, great question. Um, well, main and division mm -hmm. and division and second are both identified as uh, intersection improvement locations because those are ones where we'd need to look at like doing a traffic <coughs> study or something to to understand the best way to improve them. Um, and that's the case as well with uh, Cascade and Maine. That's another one that would be a bigger intersection improvement. Then, like we were talking about Crescent, um, Crescent and Cascade added that as an enhanced crossing opportunity. Mm -hmm. And then that's one that could potentially be done in the short term. Um, with more of a quick build approach um, and then so th this this plan doesn't get to the level of exactly what needs to happen mm -hmm. at the location because there there are a couple different options and that would be its own process sure. to figure out but um we have included some notes with ideas about what that what that could be um I think if that covered the could you just show us the access to the parks because that's something a lot of people mentioned to me as I was talking about the being on this committee is just accessing yeah. Hoffman and Glen Park as a pedestrian or bicyclist doesn't feel that safe which is kind of unfortunate 
So here we're showing an enhanced crossing okay. by Wa Hoffman Park mm -hmm. um, off of Lawson. And remind me, the blue is a buffered bikeway right on division. Is that right? Yep. Buffered bike lane. That's okay. a buffered bike lane. Okay. And then the green, is there something else going on there at division? Here? Yeah. Um, so, Which, okay. Yeah. So, in this part, the thought is to be a shared use path in that medium term category. Mm -hmm. And there's um, potentially some funding out there, and there's an application for funding um, for that that is active right now. And so to peek inside a little bit in terms of how we as city staff do our job, we have to get funding for these projects from a variety of different sources. So we have city matching funds, certainly, but we also have you know, opportunities to apply for grants. So it's really dependent on you know, when things are happening or if development comes in and they're going to tear up this street anyways, but we want a, a path on that, then we'll maybe pay in that moment to put a path in. And so it's not always going to be perfect in terms of this is highest priority, so it will be addressed immediately. But the good thing that Murray was talking about in terms of those shorter medium term fixes, those are relatively easy for the city to do on their own. And that's the kind of thing where we could make an intersection significantly more safe just by adding tape, bollards, whatever, paint as well. So that's kind of where we, that's kind of the, the how they're supposed to intertwine and how you're supposed to use different approaches to, to address all the concerns. Um, so near Hoffman Park, we're showing an enhanced crossing at 8th and then at um, Wasson, does that does that feel right? Um, or you know, would you have those changes happen elsewhere near Hoffman Park? I mean, for access to that park. No, I think that's great. <clears throat> and then you also asked about Glen Park. Oh, I. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Okay, Glen Park. So showing an enhanced crossing that could happen at Park Street mm -hmm. and yeah. Main. Are the sidewalks changing there already with that construction going on there? I can't remember if there's change in that. So I believe they're remaining in place. Um, okay. I don't I, I drove by earlier today. I don't think they've been torn up, but if they do get torn up, they're gonna be replacing them. Okay. Um, bare minimum. Okay. But I'm not aware of any improvements on okay. that. Okay. Yeah. Because there's never really been a crosswalk there, yep. right? And so then there there will be okay. Yep. That'll be great. There's gonna be a lot of increase in just volume of people with that build there. So oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, for sure. And so uh, I, again, not trying to get too like nitty gritty in terms of how government works, but say a big project came along like that. The city would then have some power to be like, okay, you can make this big project, you can realign your st the street like they did, but we're also going to ask that you pay for, or help pay for an improved crosswalk rate. <coughs> and us having these recommendations in our adopted plans gives the city jurisdiction and authority, well not jurisdiction, but authority and kind of um, legitimacy and asking a developer for this so we don't just be so they don't just say oh you just pulled that out of nowhere right we say no this is something we've identified through this long continuous process and therefore we'd like this to be included as part of this development so something something that we certainly think about as well maria could you go to division uh, yeah division and uh, quail ridge which is on the west side going into the sanctus park is that an area of concern um, the Sanctus and Quail. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. We're on our bed. Um, it's right on the edge of town, so I wouldn't be surprised if it's not a big concern, but you've got a, a nice park there and mm -hmm. you've got a bunch a lot of, of folks <laughs> down, down there. Yeah. Amy, isn't that slated for a future? Isn't there a future road there slated for reconstruction, that entrance to the Sanctus off a of quail? Or am I thinking of something else? You're right there on Dry Run Road is kind of the entrance. Yeah. Like, isn't it, wasn't that being realigned or am I wrong? We just yeah. did. Oh, we just did. Okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I guess what's the concern? It's just pedestrian a, crossing. Oh, okay. like from the neighborhood, right? Yeah, there, if we're yeah. talking parks and and mm -hmm. ex access to them, that seems like I mean, and the, the speed of traffic is, is right. Really yeah, booking absolutely. at that point. Yeah. So, would a um, a crossing improvement 
at Bob White yeah, Bob. division? Yeah, is that where it was? Mm -hmm. Bob White. Mm -hmm. If you are a bicyclist there, you gotta use division. It's like you're going on Maple Street that it went off division. So that's actually return to get into the building. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that was something that was observed a lot of the during the bike tours is that there what what's not always the most direct route is not always the safest route. And so that's kind of the point is the, the one of the long-term goals is you should be able to take division or the most direct route, right? And be mm -hmm. safe doing so on bicycle, on a bicycle. So um. Are there any, so the access to this park over here is off this residential street. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, any other parks you wanna check? Those would be the most frequented, yeah. for sure. Mm -hmm. Is there anything up by like the high school and you know, the, yeah. Let's the take a look at the high school, the rodeo, yeah. or even Lawson crossing over by Moody's, Lawson to Lawson. That is a bad one yeah. for some reason. <laughs> it's bad enough in a car. Yeah, exactly. So that's bad in a car. It's really bad on a bicycle. Currently, you know, get reconstructed in 24 around, around about at that in Cascade. That's so. everything coming off of. Yeah. I walk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Cascade coming into the east to slow things down. And being that there's no sidewalk on the North Wasson part, so when you're talking development, so when CVTC is redeveloping the Moody's property. Mm -hmm. We have that in the policy and we can say, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, we need you to. And yeah, that, that's kind of the, the idea behind that. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, would you tell us the difference? What's the difference between the blue circle and the red circle at those intersections? Yeah, so the blue circle is the intersection improvement. Uh -huh. um, so here, we're actually showing it as short term because that roundabout is in design right now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I see. So is it short term versus long term? So or short term versus quick build? So <laughs> sorry, I'm going to just keep top guessing. <laughs> 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 so, and, and can you can put that map, but you can show it either way. Um, right now I'm showing it by recommendation type, but I could switch it um, and do the spot bike pet improvements by implementation timeline. And now it shows by short, medium, mm -hmm. or long term. So I'll send the direct link to the map just so you guys don't have to dig through documents to, to find it and you can play around with it certainly after. Is there any opportunity? So Lawson heading north, the intersection past Moody's where it makes the jog to the mm -hmm. stop sign. I know there's that green space, there's some new construction going up there, but you got some soccer fields. Is there any way to just make a bike path going straight through by those soccer fields and go to like golf field and then joining up with the rest of Wasson? South Wasson curves in a Morgan Road, right? Mm -hmm. yep. yeah. And so it looks, yeah, and that's the kind of thing where it'd be relatively easy because it's city owned property, um, but I don't know if there's anything immediately on the plan. I'm just talking about and then connecting along right there. But also if we already have a greenway or whatever identified along South Wasson and then um, arching up, then I don't know if that'd be the, the most prioritized thing because you can theoretically pretty easily just go a block or two over and continue north. But yeah, um, yeah. And, and so there's an interesting component of it where how the bike and pedestrian plan uh, is compatible with the outdoor recreation plan because obviously there's a lot of kind of potential synergies for lack of, uh, for, there's a lot of ways that they can interact, right, and make it easier. And so that's something that we're going to look at closely as, as that comes out as well. And um, as there are two different consulting groups working on one, that SRF is working on the outdoor recreation and you guys are working on bike and ped, so there's going to be some crossover opportunity there, certainly. Maria, did you guys take a look at Hazel right there? Um, that's a pretty heavy connector between mm -hmm. Lawson Mm -hmm. and eight. So the um, ninth. Ninth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The Hazel, thought. Hazel Falcon more than not quite so much. Mm -hmm. The thought here was to take advantage of the potential stormwater project <laughs> oh. and to to have a a covered um, trail essentially. Yeah, basically. Yeah. 
That would be on on more again, though. What, no, so what, what is that? project would that be? <laughs> the reason why we moved from Falcon Street. <laughs> seven flooded basements. Yeah. Or a be one basement flooded seven, seven times. times. We heard in the when we met with the um, engineers that this was. Todd, Todd and Zach had some ideas on how the trail, basically the stormwater canal or whatever you want to call it. Um, there is an opportunity coming from East Division South and arcing, arcing our way through, and that way we wouldn't have to do right away acquisition or acquisition of land. It would be connected from all the way down to Maine, I think it is. It connects mm -hmm. down to, but that was just kind of an identified opportunity to do so. And the engineers, and it would not have something that I would have, I would have jumped straight to, but the engineers were the ones that suggested it. So that's the why. That's why I think it's feasible. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. So that bike or that that green dot that we're talking about on top of the stormwater, that would be a path that would go north to division through the middle school. Or the city. Yep, so that's a green way. And it, I think, I don't know if it goes past division, but just up to division. it would just connect and be another opportunity too. But it also would just wind through the neighborhoods as well. And there's some kind of alleyway or exactly what it is would have to be differentiated. My idea was a, a big lazy river going down the hill, <laughs> but uh, that was scrapped. Tim, you said yeah, the the between lake and covered, covered, covered path or covered walk. What is that when you say that? What, is, what do you mean? I don't. OK, so so covered in the sense <laughs> the ditch would be covered and paved over, and obviously the stormwater would continue uh, to flow underneath it. Okay, but, yeah, I'm sorry, and I should have clarified. I was clarified. imagining, yeah, something well, no, going no, 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 not like a literal <laughs> covered whatever. But, Essentially, some improvements where you could safely walk and bicycle along it, and stormwater would rush safely underneath you, and hopefully not flood any basements or anything else. So, but again, that's kind of that's the level of detail that we're talking about right now. That's design level, and it's the kind of thing where you know us as planners are probably not going to be able to give you a great idea of what exactly it might look like. Just that the engineer said it was feasible. So, yeah. Could we take a look at the high school? So down. Yes. I don't know if those are already um, crossings that have kind of the highest level that we would be doing in this plan, but I know that those are again places that kids are crossing in the dark a lot of the year, mm -hmm. crossing cemetery, and right now I think the speed limit is 35 through a bunch of that, which is awfully fast for pl a place where, you know, kids are crossing in the dark, but so I don't know if there's anything um yeah um so there's one crossing and yeah that there does that already have an rfp at it can you do street view i don't know how um up to date this is even okay because i know they have oh. the yellow signs right? yeah it has okay. it does have okay. a yellow sign okay yep okay. do you um is sixth the main place where kids would be crossing? Yeah, that is where I see kids crossing cemetery. Yep. And especially as there's a relatively significant, well, I guess, I mean, it depends, but there's a significant amount of houses right there. Right. And, and there's not great trail access to the south to cut through the actual school grounds by the baseball diamonds. Mm -hmm. um, actually, I was talking to Mike Stifter at Public Works about um, some equis no, just, no, there are there are opportunities <laughs> to potentially, but yeah, that that's kind of the main way to do that. So okay. yeah, I see a lot of kids cutting through when you go down at the bottom of 598th Street. They get to the bottom of that and they cut instead of going on cemetery to get to those neighborhoods. There's mm -hmm. some paths back there, and mm -hmm. um, you're usually going over someone's lawn, right? Well, and of course, part of it is too that the, there's a lot of car traffic right there in the mornings when a bunch of parents are dropping off and a bunch of kids are coming driving themselves to school. And so even the crossings across, like, you know, some occasionally I'll drive my kids to school and me entering those entrance, which isn't probably the, the city's problem, that's maybe more the school district's problem, you know, the sidewalks crossing as, as the cars are entering um kids are trying to cross it just feels very unsafe but i don't know if that's the purview of this 
committee. Maybe not if it's more on the the school district's grounds. I don't know. Hmm. Just a um, second. I'm going to add in note about that. So okay. at the so Sixth and Cemetery. Yeah, so that would be Crossing Cemetery. And um, then, but then crossing those access points where cars are coming in to drop off. I think you're right there, right? So like yeah. cars come, come in off of cemetery both directions, right? There's tons of traffic coming in and kids are trying to cross over there, you know, and um, yeah. put her on bike. It just, so I think people have mentioned it. There's also going to likely be um, sidewalk on Kennedy Street through okay. Wells Park. Mm -hmm. So theoretically you could cross, you could cut through that neighborhood from North Main, mm -hmm. arch down East Johnson, arch down Sycamore Street, go across at Kennedy and then cross mm -hmm. again at uh, 6th um, and, and 965th. Um, so yeah, I mean, theoretically, if also just from a channeling folks from yeah. North Main as well, or South Main as well, that would be <coughs> nice to mark that as a area of high crossing. Mm -hmm. Can I add one more since we're in the neighborhood? If uh -huh. you go to the east of the high school, go south of Cemetery in the east, there's Lilac Avenue. Um, and this is, yeah, keep going. Mm -hmm. um, we can zoom out of Yeah, so what what I've experienced as, as a parent with some mm -hmm. kids, what the school sells their parking passes at the beginning of the year gets sold out as kids age and get licenses uh there's no space for them so or they don't want to pay for a parking pass so they park on morning glory and lilac and so that as the year progresses that gets really crowded with students parking and then you can see that how the sidewalk works on that it uh it's not congruent mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And the kids, of course, are not very good drivers. So. <laughs> 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 yeah. So. That's, that's where those speed bumps come in. Mm, yeah. That's where that would be helpful. Mm -hmm. quick, a quick one. Slow it down. <laughs> and so there is some, and Aaron will be able to talk about this, but there's some interesting um, intersections that are also speed bumps kind of thing. So mm -hmm. those are those may, maybe spot improvements as well. Mm -hmm. So it keeps basically it goes from sidewalk top to sidewalk top and crosses all the way over mm -hmm. while also having a, a traffic calming effect. Mm -hmm. Raised crossings. Raised yeah. crossings, that's the word. Um, right. Are there any other areas you want to zoom in on? Nothing big changing North Main was there for bicycles. I know we had talked about trying to give folks bicycle access, better bicycle access to Whitetail Ridge, you know, for biking, but also then for working, you know, people going out there to recreate. So what's changing out there? So the intersection, but like all the, in the yeah, and yeah. What we're showing is uh, um, adding a shared use path. Okay. I think this is like right. Is that Tatters already? Right yeah. yeah. Um, and then two different improved ways okay. up there. Mm -hmm. This would be a bicycle boulevard, I believe. Yep. And then um, could potentially do a protected bike lane mm -hmm. as a short term project on North Main. If we were to go north and Sterling Ponds mm -hmm. and their access to River Falls, show me how that works. <laughs> Roundabout to mm -hmm. mm -hmm. oh, Yeah, right. So adding securities paths up on this side to help them get over here. We're talking about north on Paulson. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. So a development is in the application phase of beyond a section of that. And as part of that development, there'd be sidewalk coming in. So trying to kind of piecemeal those pieces together a little bit would be part of that goal and part of the implementation of that, um, especially as it goes down and eventually connects ideally to where that uh, 
shared use path picks up by the police station. Oh, you're saying sidewalk would go in or shared use path would go in the development? A trail, a shared use path, okay. I think. I, I don't think we've gotten to that level of specifics. Nothing on Hoopert? Hoopert was a question I had too. Yeah, that was part of staff feedback. That so I don't think you guys yeah. have updated it just yet. Yeah, we haven't made updates <laughs> from from staff feedback. Um, one of the challenging things is this intersection yeah. or this interchange. Mm -hmm. um, real, that's real time. Yeah, you don't want to turn it over. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, they go over past crossing yeah very years ago yeah right? i think you're right amy but i think with the construction of the highway they probably have uh -huh. <laughs> to get in here kind of <laughs> 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 um, yeah so yeah so we will look at, at putting something on right here yeah. and i believe right around here there's the new disc golf mm -hmm. course oh yeah so we want to be connecting to that as well. Does anybody know what the rule law recommendation is for, say, the sidewalk along Main Street? So let's say, like Bob and Steve's Auto Value, kind of heading north. There's a sidewalk there. Can you? It, it's tight for bikers and walkers. Can you? I know on Main Street, I'm not supposed to ride a bike down there, but once you get out of the downtown, old downtown area, can you? technically ride a bike on that sidewalk or is it recommended that you jump on the road and ride on the shoulder? I don't know. That's probably one of the most geographically difficult parts of town just yeah. generally. It bottlenecks so badly right there. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> probably a moonshot very you know idealistic goal of staff would be to have a um, separate shared use crossing kind of off West Quarry that you could cross the river at and that way you wouldn't be constrained by North Main Street and there are I think maybe I thought I thought our city engineer had said that there's some railroad uh, foundations that had once crossed there at some point yeah. in time um, but that's something that we're exploring and that's like long range because you know that's a big deal right but that's ideally how we would address that sort of thing um because you can't really widen that way i don't have a good answer for you in terms of what you're technically supposed to do free for all free for all mm -hmm. <clears throat> i had i guess questions tied into that just from the main street even second street corridor yeah. what your thoughts were on how those function yes um so what we're showing right now on Second Street is a buffered bike lane that could be done in the short term. And then on Main Street, with the volume of traffic there, we'd be wanting a protected bike lane. Um, but that would be a long term project. And as I understand it, Main Street is a reconstruction, possible reconstruction candidate. So the thought is to uh, put a buffered bike lane on Second Street in the short term do the planning process around Maine and and through that process you could you know decide as a community if you want to have a bike facility on Maine mm -hmm. but at least in the meantime you know put something on second allow people to connect to destinations that way and say in 10 years if you reconstruct Maine and you say we're going to do this you know beautiful high quality facility on Maine maybe maybe take out the buffered bike lane that's on second at that point. Um, but this is really about like how can we get the most complete network mm -hmm. as quickly as possible? Um, and so yeah, ultimately maybe there's it's only on either main or second, but um, I would say doing something on second right now or, or in the next few years is probably more feasible than getting something done on main. Um, quickly. And, and I think the size of the width of Second Street probably lends itself to that a little bit in terms of your, I would guess, in your calculations because it's yes. a pretty, pretty wide street. Mm -hmm. um, I want to be conscious of everybody's time. Yes. It is quarter to eight. Um, Can I ask you a quick question? Amy? The with the North North Division, the extension of this path, what, do we have a timeline? I have no idea what like to Genevieve's property. 
to the moon. <laughs> I do not have a timeline, Mike. <laughs> okay. It is in the key corridor plan. <laughs> um, yeah, I haven't had those discussions at this point. We're talking about this. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that's where that train, that old train track that you're talking about goes to there. Yeah, and we're also going to add some recommendations that were in the Kinney Corridor plan mm -hmm. as well. Um, so, I'm not. not trying to get in the weeds, but would there be a recommendation for a crossing at, at the Kinney if it continued north, up north along Division? Because I don't think you have enough room to squeeze in a bike lane between, or a, a trail between those. You would mm -hmm. think it'd cross, right? Theoretically. Have to look at what was in the yeah. Kinney Corridor plan. So, just up off the map, it, we'd need a bridge there. Just up where it curves, to right there. Nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. And then up further is where the, there's, I think, install grade raised, mm -hmm. where it connects to Paulson. Yeah. Um, so. But, like, that's a difficulty, but also just, it, it shows that we're reliant on a lot of things outside of our control and the fact that the free market factor of, you know, someone doesn't want to sell, somebody doesn't want to sell, you know what I mean? And so fundamentally, we can only prepare for the best in place, kind of the building blocks in place, so we can capitalize on things like that. But it's not easy. <laughs> so, easy. Um, <laughs> so Sam's going to send out the link to this map, and yeah. if if you all have more thoughts, you know, things you think are, you know, wrong in some way, or you would add, or that you're really excited about that we didn't talk about today, um, it'd be great if, you know, in the next couple of days, you can send on any other thoughts that you have, and then we can get them incorporated along with the city staff comments and um, have an updated recommendations map. We did include it in our comments to kind of the connections outside of the city. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 That's working as well. So. Mm -hmm. Is there anything anywhere in the city? Because I know like Ellsworth, Prescott, like the use of golf carts, side, that sort of thing on city roads. Is that? In the works at all, or we have something on the TVs, I thought. We have one on neighborhood electric vehicles. It's pretty, pretty daily. Vehicles, so. But the idea, I think it can go up to 35, something like that. Remember that? <laughs> yeah, um, neighborhood electric vehicles. But yeah. side by sides, are not. They're just, yeah, it's like a golf specific cart. type of. Electric golf cart. Yeah, electric golf cart. Slightly different, but side by sides and UTVs yeah. are not. <laughs> side by sides and UTVs are not allowed on city streets. Okay. So I want to make sure that we touch on our, the policy and program recommendations, which Erin has been patiently waiting. Yeah, this is great. I can skip over all the intro because you've already mentioned like half of the policies that we brought up. So you've already talked about the intro. You've already set up the importance of having these types of policies and plans in place so that you have something to point to when an opportunity arises. So a lot of what we're recommending, I can go through it pretty quickly, um, but a lot of what we're recommending is really just helping the city prepare to be opportunistic. And, um, you know, if there are opportunities to partner with conservation easements and add trails, things like that, partner with new development. So we've kind of divided them up into six categories. Um, and we'll touch on, I think, a, yeah, like a number of specific projects that you've already talked about today. Um, but the first category we wanted to start with is coordinating with new infill development, um, knowing that you know, all of this great planning work has already been done in River Falls to point to areas that we think are going to have a lot of growth. Um, and so being able to update subdivision ordinances and zoning policies um, to be able to really align with ambitious biking and walking goals, making sure that new buildings have bike and pedestrian access, um, being able to, you know, require developments over a certain number of units or within certain designated growth areas or gaps in the biking and walking network are really helping fill in those gaps um, as development opportunities arise. Um, the third point up here, uh, designating funding for opportunistic sidewalk and trail investment is kind of 
acknowledging like some of the examples that we already talked about if a development occurs and you know there's still a one block gap to a trail like mm -hmm. is there a little bit of flexible funding that the city would be able to designate to fill in that um that one block that would really make a big difference even though you can't quite get the developer to do that last block um so trying to set the city up well um, for that kind of funding uh, the next category, uh, bringing key, recommend, key network recommendations into the focus of Falls plan. Again, this focuses on all the prior planning work that's already been done. Um, looking at the South Main Street study and the campus corridor plan, um, there's already a lot of sites or specific um, like areas that have been you know, targeted for infill development or we're anticipating additional growth, their attention. Um, so really being able to focus our future network recommendations on some of those areas and those specific roadway barriers. Uh, again, talking about bottlenecking, you know, on the north side of town, how do we um, how do we partner with uh, potentially other agencies who might have some jurisdiction there or, or being able to take advantage of um, future projects to partner uh, and put those into the network. That's what really what these are all focused on. Um, prioritizing trail development and park and recreation areas. Again, we already talked about some of these old rights of way, looking at old rights of way and looking at conservation easements, partnering with landowners um, to allow for trail access, because maybe trail access is a part of their motivating factor in you know getting involved with the conservation easement. So how can we set up policies and uh, be strategic about relationships and tools in the toolbox that um, the city will be ready to uh, partner with those folks again opportunistically maybe as uh, as sites become available or as opportunities arise. Uh, bicycle and pedestrian planning. This one feels really bare bones, but it really helps um, just like check some of the boxes on kind of formalizing the bike pen planning process as River Falls keeps growing, as you know, planning keeps getting a little more sophisticated, setting up uh, like recurring bike and ped plan updates. You know, the last bike ped plan said update this in five years and took a little more than five years <laughs> uh, for you five folks to be sitting here today looking at this plan. So um, trying to trying to get in some more structure um, to reassess as the city keeps growing and conditions keep changing and new opportunities arise. Um, using the bike pad plan to apply, apply for grant funding. So we already touched on this. That's how things get done, how so many projects get done. This is a really good funding environment. Um, federally, all the way down, a lot of people are putting money into active transportation plans right now and, and infrastructure. So to be able to have all these great plans and uh, infrastructure, you know, suggestions all set up. Um, also getting kind of a you know stronger funding um, policies in place to help to help the city uh, really leverage that um, to get some of those projects to actually happen. Really focus on that. Um, and then a couple of these last ones, including shared use path condition in the city survey of pavement quality and maintenance planning, developing an ADA transition plan. Both of those kind of touch on things that we've talked about tonight about not having complete sidewalk data or not having curb ramp data or like the full conditions to be able to you know apply for grant funding or point to specific projects that we know you know what the full set of needs and what potential costs are and things like that. The more data you have, the more you can do with it. So that's really just focused on kind of making a regular update to those um, those conditions and, and having a good sense of um, pavement quality and condition um, so that you can be uh, updating accordingly. Um, last two, creating a bicycle and pedestrian advisory committee of BPAC, um, solidifying, you know, just another formalized tool to help get citizen input into the bike planning process as more decisions need to be made about priorities and opportunities down the road. Um, that's a great way to get, you know, a diverse group of community partners and residents um, all working to, you know, represent different geographies, lived experiences, comfort levels on a bicycle, all of that. It's really helpful to have that group to be able to go to more frequently and say, this project came up, do you see a way we can, you know, fit by pet in? Um, and there's lots of great examples of other communities um, who have the packs to pull from to see how they do it. Um, to really help strengthen that bike ped planning. Um, instituting a bike count program, again, just having more data, understanding, you know, or having a couple different methods to collect data uh, and measure before and after facility use, you know, talking about main and second, you know, being able to demonstrate the use of a potential short-term bike layout in second um, when conversations come up for what to do with main. That's really helpful context for planners, engineers, the community, everyone involved. So um, being able to formalize that would be really helpful. Um, getting down to the last couple here, infrastructure guidelines. Um, I, I think the, the Y shoulder is a great example of, of why it's really important to have, you know, potentially a complete streets policy or a design manual with really strong preferred bikeway design facilities on it. 
um, so that when those when those opportunities come up or when we're working to implement parts of this plan, um, we have really good and locally specific, really context specific solutions that we can start building on our streets um, rather than having to, uh, you know, build something that doesn't quite work for you know Main Street or Division or whatever your exact context is. Being able to pull from you know national guidance like NACDO and uh, the Federal Highway Administration, um, some like town and rural multimodal planning tools, um, being able to point to some of those um, and develop you know some city best practices so that engineers are on board, planners are on board, everyone's on board, and we have an opportunity. You know what you can put on your streets, um, and then designating staff time and identifying a clear point person for biking and walking efforts. Um, even just having a small amount of staff time set aside to be able to really focus on bike pet efforts. And I know staff do so many things already. Even just being able to say, "Nope, this is my 10 hours a week. I am full bike pet," um, can really make a difference in helping uh, improve coordination and efficiency of some of these some of these um, ideas and opportunities. And the last one. Um, education. Um, so looking at uh, how we use some of these recommendations to educate the community on what, you know, biking and walking can look like in River Falls. Um, Maria talked about demonstration projects. Uh, they're a great tool to educate and engage community members about, you know, what are your preferred designs? What do you want? Where do you want it to help keep refining this plan and keep your bike pet planning work? Um, and it's a great way to build kind of empowerment. The last two are also, you know, developing like education opportunities for adults and then integrating with safe routes to school and middle school and high school but school education efforts. Um, they're all great ways to just help people see themselves on a bike and see them walking and to help kind of connect the dots of, you know, maybe not everyone thinks of themselves as someone who would take advantage of a new bike lane in front of their house, but helping people get out and see themselves and see their community members on it really helps build that community and that confidence and empowerment around biking and walking. So moving forward, um, this has been really helpful feedback to just like listen to and hear how you talk about some of these projects and opportunities and some of the complexity of them. We are thinking about kind of, I don't want to use the word prioritizing super strongly, but uh, thinking about like a loose prioritization for some of these policy and program recommendations, thinking about their benefit and their um, simplicity or how many you know, how many moving parts there are uh, trying to actually get it in place. Um, just like the short, medium, long term of the physical infrastructure, thinking about what are some of the low hanging fruits that could be relatively easy to implement and, you know, would help out right away. Some of those development standards that would, you know, help out tomorrow as you're approving applications and things like that. We're going to try to put some, um, put some of this context around those recommendations to help the city figure out what is worth putting time and thought into right now versus down the road when there's, when there's an opportunity. So. I will pause there. <laughs> I should have timed myself. That was amazing. Uh, again, <laughs> you set up most of them. So that's our way of thinking about some of these things you were already thinking about. But was there anything that I said that was an add to what you already talked about or that you would change or, or anything that really got you excited that we should think about prioritizing as we, as we go into that framework? Some hard thinking faces. Yeah. <laughs> and you're also welcome to sit with sit with it and provide um, some feedback later this week. It's such an enormous task because it's literally like how do you make the entire city walkable and bikeable in some way, mm -hmm. and it's so difficult. To, like, where do you even start? You know, so. Yeah, it's a uh, it's something you got to sit with, and I will like like Maria said, I will send out that link. Um, if there's anything that comes to you, or you think, oh, this intersection really is pretty awful, if you come across, by all means, send it our way, um, and it'll be included in the plan. Um, Can I just ask a question? So the policy stuff that you just walked us through is that included in the plan is that separate okay so it's part of the plan as sort of these recommendations to make these policy changes okay. so we'll get policy recommendations staff will sure and then staff will then and certainly correct me if i'm wrong but then staff will write these code amendments or someone else will write okay. these code amendments sure. and then it'll go through your standard process right. of going to planning commission going to council yeah. and then that is then 
a law to some right. degree or a okay. city rule. And so therefore going forward, it has to meet this. So it's, it is still a democratic process of in the course. way of right. yep. city staff is not playing God and deciding <laughs> this goes here and this does this. Um, it is still go through council ultimately. But I would say, I mean, as a, as a overall policy for lack of a better word, you know, the city has placed a high priority in planning mm -hmm. in the past. And we really look back to those documents that are approved by council and, and try to lean on those for implementation as we go forward. So they've got some pretty good weight here in the city. Mm -hmm. And engagement goes a long ways. Not a lot of people show up to planning commission or council meetings. If people show up and say, I want this policy where uh, sidewalks are on all sides of new developments, council and planning commission will listen to that kind of thing. You know, mm -hmm. so it's like that is the way you can exercise your power beyond just being on the steering committee as well. So. So we're right at eight o'clock, um, so I want to touch on what is happening next. So we are going to be refining the recommendations um, and like we talked about prioritizing those program and policy recommendations, prioritizing the infrastructure investments. So basically just figuring out, you know, what what might be good to do first um, and uh, then doing some estimation of costs for infrastructure. So um putting some more kind of numbers behind things to help um basically it's it's all about helping the city staff make decisions and um use their time efficiently so we'll be taking those steps and pulling everything together into the draft plan document and that'll go to city staff for review before it comes to you all for review um we are right now aiming to have that draft plan to city staff in about three weeks. Um, so if you have additional thoughts about the recommendations that we shared tonight, you know, as soon as possible, if you can provide that feedback, then we can get it integrated into the plan. Um, and then looking ahead, um, so this is right now is meeting three of four of our steering committee meetings and the last one we'd like it to be November 30th which is a little off from the first Wednesday of the month mm -hmm. um, but that would be so that we can get your feedback um, on the plan with enough time to make changes before the planning commission meeting which will be December 15th um, so I'm curious if that November 30th date will work okay. And so just so we're clear at that meeting, we will be Reading for the resolution of this group, looking for a recommendation to Plan Commission and Council on whether to, you know, you guys are looking to approve or put forth the plan. So we will need a quorum at that meeting. Um, so we'll probably do some due diligence beforehand to make sure we've got folks coming. I'll be chasing down folks for positive <laughs> RSVPs. Is that four of six for a quorum? Yeah, yeah, more than 50%. Yeah. So that's all we have for you. Um, I know we put a lot of information out there. <laughs> it's the end of so it's a long day, so I really appreciate your time um, and definitely would love to hear anything else that occurs to you, you know, if you have a chance to zoom in out on our map and um, if you notice anything, then all yours definitely want to incorporate that into the plan. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, folks. Thanks, guys.